Welcome to the Kings Beat Podcast. I am James Ham, Kings Insider for ESPN 1320 and the Kings Beat. Joining me today, Fox 40, Sean Cunningham. Sean, how are you? I'm pretty good this week. Um, I am getting over a day of beautiful weather. Well, actually not beautiful weather, but I went up to Tahoe to play golf ahead of the American Century Championship at Edgewood Tahoe. Uh, free round of golf in in what was probably one of the top golf courses I've ever played. I've played there a few times. And uh, I like I love the fact that it's like rated one of the top 100 courses in the world. But my game is probably in the below 100 golfers in the world. So I hacked the shit out of that course. And don't feel bad about it. So it's got plenty of time to recover <laughs> before the uh, celebrities take the field in July and a few cup coming up here in a couple of weeks. And uh, um, it was weird because there's a lot of like rain around us, but yet uh, we didn't really get much of a drop. There was a lot of lightning around us, and we were uh, we were okay. So okay. played like shit, but had a great had a great time. You never want to uh, swing a golf club in in the thunder and lightning there sean that's i know yeah we were we were relying heavily upon the uh the marshals and the 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 people who know better to say whether or not we were in danger so it was yeah. fortunately we were okay uh sean had a good day it sounds like um so let's introduce our other uh co-host here in brendan nunes from the king's polls podcast brendan how are you i'm doing well uh draft is rapidly approaching and my, my question for Sean, having seen your yep. Instagram story and who was there, uh, best golfer between yourself, Biederman, and Matt George? My friend, Jose Reynoso. Okay. He was oh. on it, man. He was absolutely on it. Uh, but uh, amongst us three, uh, it's it's easily Biederman. He plays a lot. I played in this event. I played this last year, right? Literally to the date. Uh, it was June 8th. And uh, it was myself and... Uh, former co-worker Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Polaris, who now works with the 49ers, and Chris Tavares, and Jose also joined us in that round, and uh, Jose is probably the best of the bunch uh, in the in our foursome, but this year, um, I, I dude, I hadn't, I played one time at Catavadera since that last round last year, and this, uh, and, and, and just returning to it this year, I was all sorts of nervous, so I knew, I mean, I'm already a terrible golfer, but being able to go out and play and like play anything respectable <laughs> was just not in the cards. I used to be decent, but the back injuries will wipe me out. I haven't played in a couple of years. Uh, I used to go out with Doug on occasion uh, out of Catavadera and, and go and play. When I was younger, I, I played a ton. Um, but Biederman's a big dude. I'm sure he can crush a ball off the tee. Yeah. Yeah. He does. He does very well. He does yeah. Very well. Yeah. He's a big dude. Um, all right, uh, let's get to it. So uh, let's just hit the business stuff. If you're watching here on the YouTube and you don't mind, give us a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe. Jump on board with uh, the Kings Beat. Go to thekingsbeat.com and become a premium subscriber there. That would be very cool. Uh, we did have a happy hour this week on Tuesday, so we're only doing one podcast. Gary St. Jean dropped by. Absolutely spectacular. Uh, I knew he'd be a great guest, and he was. Uh, we had a great time reminiscing about the uh, all of the players from the 90s with the Sacramento Kings, and uh, just a really cool conversation. Um, I don't think he'd mind me sharing this, but uh, because it is off the record, but uh, Pete Youngman showed up late in the uh, happy hour and just gave Gary like a big thank you uh, because Gary was – uh, one of the guys that were there when Pete got his start in uh, in the training business with the Sacramento Kings. And uh, it was like this really cool moment. And then Pete hung out and answered questions. And we chatted G Lee. We talked uh, all kinds of stuff with, uh, with Pete for a little while. So if you're missing out on the happy hours, uh, it's your bad. Uh, we give you notices all the time. But uh, next time, jump on board uh, with the Kings beat and uh, with a premium subscription and, and join us for happy hour. Um, we've got some news. I mean, nothing catastrophic or anything, but, uh, Sasha Vazenkov took a kind of a bad step on a rebound, uh, and left game two of the Greek league finals yesterday and, uh, had to be helped off the court. 
Um, we're hearing that it's nothing major, that it might be like a bone bruise. Uh, but uh, just what are we thinking here? Uh, we'll start with Sean. Sean, your thoughts on the potential for Sasha to have injured himself and, and sort of what that means for the Kings? Oh, I don't think it means much for the Kings. I mean, I think they can breathe a huge collective sigh of relief that it wasn't anything serious. Um, I wasn't aware of it until um, rather late, maybe early this morning um, was the first time I saw it, saw the video of it. And um, yeah, it, it didn't look good, but yeah, I mean, uh, very much a collective sigh of relief. I think that um, he'll probably end up missing about, a, I mean, a little over a week or so. Um, we'll see, we'll see how that, how it all acts up. I mean, without talking to any of their medical people or anything like that, like just is what it is. It's basketball injuries happen. And, uh, fortunately it doesn't look to be super serious. So, um, really got to kind of feel for him because what, what this, uh, this tournament and all this stuff means for him and what could likely be the last time he plays out there for a while. And, uh, you know, aspirations of the NBA lie ahead and um, see what that looks like. But yeah, I mean, just, just more than anything, just look, it was just a breath of fresh air that it wasn't uh, more serious. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what, we'll see what the rest of the, the weeks uh, uh, lie ahead and see what happens if he can get back out on the court. Yeah. Brendan, yeah. go for it. Yeah. I think it, hopefully not being anything serious, the bone bruise, um, potential is encouraging and the fact that he's listed is is questionable for their next game I think is also encouraging but at the same time this is the Greek Basket League finals so I'm sure that questionable doesn't necessarily mean much I'm sure it'd be questionable no matter right it's unless he was just completely um, just unable to no chance at all so slightly encouraging um, it was it did end up being a loss for Olympiacos and this is actually the first time they lost um, this season they went 22 and 0 in the regular season. In the first round of the playoffs, it was a best of three. They won 2 0. Second round, best of five. They won 3 0. They were up 1 0 in this finals and then ended up dropping this game. I think they were up to or down to when Sasha went down, but obviously not having him there to close uh, plays a factor when he's Greek League MVP and so essential to the team. So their undefeated, potential undefeated season all the way through uh, does end up suffering here, but hopefully Sasha's all right. And if as long as it's not too, anything too long term, which doesn't sound like it is, I don't think it changes anything from Sacramento's perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're always concerned when there is a knee issue and uh, just like I don't think it changes the Kings offseason plans. I mean, clearly, if he blew his ACL, it changes a lot of Kings offseason plans. Um, but uh, it's, it's funny because it reminds me of, you know, like, uh, Peja Stoyakovic uh, after he was drafted before he came over, he had like a, he broke his leg, uh, badly in a Greek league game. Um, and then of course, uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich before Bogey came over, he hurt his knee and had to have a scope and, uh, he ended up having quite a bit of like bumps and bruises with his knee He played way too many games over the course of like a year and a half. Um, but again, a player that, you know, the European game, just because you you're playing, I mean, you are in actual games and there's potential for injury and everything else. Um, and, and then the other thing I wanted to point out is that the team that they're playing in Greece is like filled with former Kings or former King uh, like prospects. So Yorgos Papayanis is there. Derek Williams, the Coke machine, plays for that team. And then uh, I think it's Arturis Gorditis, uh, who the Kings had traded for his draft right two years ago. And then they actually traded him like uh, as part of the Halliburton deal, I believe. Um, he he plays for that team as well, which is just, you know, a, a Greek league player that's probably not coming over. Um, I, I don't think any of it like means all that much. I think it could have been like very important for the, for the Kings, but what are you guys feeling? Is it still Sean, you, you said 90, 10, um, before, and, and then we started hearing like some murmurs that there's possibility that Vizenkov is looking for like a $10 million starting salary. Um, I, I don't know. What do you make of all this? And what do you think the chances are of him being in a Kings uniform next season? Oh, I think the chances are still very, very high. I mean, these are what negotiations will look like, and uh, they'll sort out the money 
um, if they can't, if, you know, I'm pretty confident that they'll be able to reach an agreement. But yeah, I, I know at least from a from a Kings standpoint, the desire uh, for him to be in a Kings uniform next season is strong, and uh, we'll we'll kind of see what that looks like. Um, I don't think much has changed on that front, um, although you know I haven't checked in on anything in the past week or so. So yeah, me um, neither. This is, I mean. He's done everything that, uh, and then some, in terms of what uh, his season looked like, and and playing overseas, and you know f- all that. Like he's, you know, everything has uh, gone. I think has met or exceeded expectations in terms of what his season and what his uh, prospects would be before coming over to the NBA. And uh, you know, if you're an NBA free agent, you're going to try to lock down as much money as you can. So. Um, if there's a, if there's a number in mind, they'll, they'll, they'll slide pieces of paper across the proverbial table and they'll read them and see what they can do to either, uh, meet his expectation or at least come close to it. Yeah. I know we've, I know we've said it before, but I'll just kind of echo that. I I think he's such a good fit on this team offensively. You watch Olympiacos play and they have such a player and ball movement offense that I really do feel looks fairly similar to Sacramento's. You can see the parallels and it's just a guy that led the Euro league in scoring Euro league MVP on 65 and a half percent from two 37.8% from three on just over five attempts per game, all within the flow of the offense. One of the things Chimo pointed out to me is how efficient he is with his dribbles, um, which I, I think again, just points towards playing within the flow of the offense. I, I really do think that he's a guy that on the right nights, could be closing games if he's on. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think he's, first of all, he's seasoned. You know, he, he'll be 28, I think, before the season starts. And for me, this is kind of like it. If he doesn't want to come over now, I don't know that you revisit this next season. And I also don't know that, like, he really has that much as an asset because if he doesn't come over at 28, you know, now you're looking at 29, 30. Like, I don't know that it's worthwhile for a team to really invest that heavily. Um, But this is kind of like the season that you would think that he would come over and also point out like he's been a pro since he's 15, but his progress in like the last two to three seasons is crazy. Like he was not this player before and all of a sudden, whether it's opportunity or it's self-improvement or just finding like the right niche and like, you know, like having a, an incredible improvement. uh, There's something going on there where you're like, okay, this is that you've, you've kind of built up to the point where you're an NBA player. And I think the NBA game with the spacing of the NBA game, which is much better than the European game. I actually think he'll, he'll actually have no problems fitting in and, and being a productive player. Now, whether that means as a starter or not, I have no idea. Like I, my guess would be that he's not a starting NBA quality player at this point, just because he doesn't have, like spectacular lateral quickness he's not a great defender he's an okay rebounder all these things but um i still think he's interesting and i still think that you know it's a it's a nice asset to have if you're the sacramento kings um let's get to some of the other things Uh, by the way did you see uh any of the box score from uh you mentioned some of those other players i was curious how Papianis looked with athens he's he's had a really good season he's averaged like 10 points six rebounds um, over a block a game um, like he's been quality he comes off the bench from what I could tell um, that could have been matchups but he does uh, he comes off the bench in, in the series um, but yeah and, and the crazy thing Sean just think how long ago it feels like that was when Poppy on because you remember that's like they were building the arena still they had us up into that um, that weird lounge that they had in the building around the corner um, right. Yeah, and he's only 25 still. And for that matter... What are you saying, James? I'm saying... Well, <laughs> I, I just think that's crazy. Like, it's crazy because he was a 2016 draft. That's like seven years ago. Um, yeah, it's just wild to me that he's only 25. And, and the Derek Williams is 32. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Derek, Derek Williams, uh, one of the best shoe collections I've ever seen in a professional athlete. It's oh. legendary, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, kind of getting to know him a little bit when he was a Kings player. Obviously, as a player, he didn't really amount to much, but it was uh, tough being a former, what, number two, number three pick. 
uh, for two. him. So yeah, just uh, not good. I also noticed uh, 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 Alex uh, Tedekumpo is also on that team, and uh, Giannis oh. got all the headlines for being courtside for that game. Yeah, I mean they just mass produce those Antetokounmpo boys. Like there's a never ending pipeline of them. I don't know how many. It, it feels like there's 47 of them. Um, yeah. I think yeah. Alex is the one that was on the Kings summer league roster yeah, for a second. That's the one. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, okay, let's get to uh let's get to a couple of things. Um since we're dead here in the off season, um, and we got the draft, which is what, two weeks away. Um what, can I will... can I stop you there real quick? Just to, what's your excitement level? I mean, here we are. <laughs> like two weeks away. I, I, I honestly, I know, look, and this has nothing to do with them having, you know, three picks total and a 24th pick. I thought I'd be a little bit more excited for the draft. I'm really not like it. I am. I'm just, I mean, there, there's, there's certainly I'm having kind of fun, you know, pouring some time into uh, researching a lot of the players. And, and um, I feel like maybe it's because this year, uh, there's a lot of players I'm not just quite as versed in. Um, certainly, I know, you know, I'm familiar with a lot of the upper echelon tier of players because those are going to be p- people that really become factors in the league. And But from a Kings perspective and, and some of the players around there, it's like kind of leaning a little bit more towards, well, I know this person because they played at a, you know, a, a school like Missouri or, you know, an Ohio State or something like that. It was just things that there's just not a lot of guys that I just, uh, him fawning over in terms of uh, excitement for this draft. I just wondered if that was reciprocated by you fellas. Uh, Brennan, go ahead. There's like certain guys that I think are intriguing, but I certainly don't have one that I- I'm just like all about. It- it's just so different of a process at 24 compared to even mid late lottery. Um, I- I'm more excited for the draft and like the day of, because I feel like it signifies the start of, the off season, you get all the fun trades that happen on, on draft night and everything. So I'm more so excited for the draft because of all that. And the actual draft process of uh, picking at 24 for Sacramento has definitely been different for me. Cause I feel like you have to know the 20 or so that you feel like are going before that, before you can even decide that this guy is going to be there at 24. Um, so it's definitely been a different process. I'm not as excited, but I feel like that's kind of just the nature of, where the Kings are picking now compared to years prior. Yeah. I'll say this too. Like this draft in particular, I really do believe that from like 15 to 40, it's wide open. Like there's all kinds of players that you could see going, you know, at like number 17 that other people like don't even have them anywhere near, you know, the, the first round. And and then like we had, who's the guy that, um, for was it Kentucky? The kid that, just canceled seven workouts and they think he's got a promise Livingston, right? Oh, okay. lively. I thought you were talking about, is it Derek? Lively? Wallace. <laughs> no, no, it's not Derek lively. It's, it's, it was Livingston. Derek Lively's Duke. You're talking, I thought you were talking about if it's Kentucky, I thought you were talking about case and Wallace. No, no. Uh, so I, I'm almost positive. I I'm not crazy here. I, I believe it's oh, you're crazy. Uh, I am crazy, but in this, <laughs> uh, okay. Chris Livingston, he is a six foot six forward for Kentucky, average 6.3, 4.2. Um, and then, like, the, it came out yesterday, he just canceled seven workouts and that he's, uh, he's basically got some sort of promise. And then I look and I'm like, man, I can't find this guy at almost any draft board anywhere. He's not even on in the top 60 on any of the, the mocks that you're looking at. You're like, who is this guy and how, so that's what I mean. This draft has this weird feel where like, uh, what is it? Kalabali? Like he yeah. looks like he's around a 25 to 35 prospect. And then all of a sudden we start hearing rumors. He's got a lottery promise. And so I think that it's a very strange draft and it leads me to this question. Like there are some interesting prospects. There are some guys that like I could see the Kings being interested in. And there are some guys that like, we all know what the Kings kind of need. They, if you're drafting at 24, you're going to go with best player, right? But you're also going to look for, if you can, a long athletic 3 4 combo that, you know, has a seven foot one wingspan that can play defense and maybe hit some threes, right? 
And there's a group of players that that probably can do that. Most of them aren't very good three-point shooters at this point. And I'm looking at it, and then I thought to myself, is it possible that Kessler Edwards is better fit to play not only now, but in the next couple of seasons than any of the guys that they could draft at number 24? I, I mean, am I am I wild in thinking that? Because, I mean, Kessler, well, he's 22. I mean, yeah. he's a young player. He's... The same six foot eight with a seven foot one, seven foot two, seven foot three wingspan. He's been in your system, and it just feels like you might already have the solution to that problem if you're looking for that solution with the twenty fourth pick. Yeah, I don't. I, I, think, I, I mean, I think you can get better at the position. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying like if we're lo- talking about rotation ten through fifteen, which is what your twenty fourth pick is going to be, Kessler Edwards might be a better option. Than anyone yeah, I, th- I think you're more hyper focused on a certain, for example, I don't think one, my, my whole take from that, James, is one has nothing to do with the other. Like Kessler Edwards' role on the team has no, has no bearing on how you draft 24. Does that make sense? Like you're not going in there going, I'm looking for Kessler Edwards. You're going in there looking for the best player. It could be a point guard, it could be a two guard. It doesn't yeah. matter. If you can find someone that can help you now, great. But you're going in there, the, 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 re- the reality of this player being able to help you in the immediate future. Is not that high, so you still go out there and you try to fill what best is going to set you up for the future. So um, to narrow it down that that sharply and that that folk, like I I can I can see the pe- people trying to do that based on needs right right away and try to like hey they need this therefore they should draft this and it's like it's not that it's not that simple and and that's one of the reasons why I was kind of you know trying to get into the whole how excited are you for the draft because. I actually do think there's a lot of excitement that comes from drafting lower in the draft when the possibilities are really endless. And I mean, you could go, I mean, you, you really have more options than you do really when you're drafting so higher in the, in the draft when, when you're, you you know, everything's not as you almost have more of a laser focus on, Oh, well, it's going to go either one of four or five situations here. It's like, you've probably got 20 situations that you could really entertain. Um, and whatever their draft board looks like, whatever those top two kind of players look like when they get to 24, uh, what happens? So I, I actually think there's a little bit more excitement because of just how many um, how many paths that they can really take um, to trying to better this team. And I, and I think one of the things that I should be more excited about is I do think there's talent that that is down there and, and hopefully mm-hmm. there's talent that can have that immediate impact is what you're looking for, for sure. But uh, I just, you know, I, when you, when we start looking at, it, I just don't think like, well, they've got this player and that, and that means it'll take this off the table. I just don't think it gets that, um, that fine tuned of things, but I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of just slapping myself for, for not being more excited for this draft and uh, than probably what I should be. I, I think get no, what no one wants to see Sean slap himself. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. Yeah, some might get joy. Wouldn't that. hate it. I bet you some people would would enjoy it. <laughs> the comments. Yeah. Um, I I get what you're saying, James. Of like a, you know, when you're laying out what the prototype that the Sacramento Kings team needs, like there is Kessel Edwards sitting right there. Um, but I'll say I think that like Casey Akpala hypothetically fit that as well and didn't work out. And I say that to say, like, I think it's good to have a couple rules of the dice there. You don't know if Kessler Edwards is going to work. And you do kind of need that rangy wing athletic defender. And there's guys like a Julian Phillips that obviously they're going to have their differences, but you can look at him and be like, okay, this is sort of Kessler Edwards ish, but it just gives you another shot at one of those two potentially working out because as much as Kessler had encouraging moments, I don't think he's somebody that you can rely on currently no i totally get that i totally get that um and i think that when we're we're looking at what they're going to draft here uh, a little bit to sean's point i think it is a little bit more wide open than we would like to think i mean the kings need they don't just need a wing they they clearly you know again matthew delavadova is gone um he he's already signed to the abl so he's not coming back so now you're you have one roster spot open there. There's going to be other roster spots open. Terrence Davis, uh, like who knows if he'll be back, but there's a good chance he won't be back. And so there's another guard. And so all of a sudden you're looking at like a handful of other options. Like, do you, how do you view Keon Ellis? Um, 
you know, I heard today Jill Adge hit me up and she said that uh, Brandon Podziemski, I, I don't know, from Santa Clara. Yeah. Uh, that he actually came to Sacramento recently. Um, he's a kid who 20 years old. He's a shooting guard, six foot five, six foot six, uh, scored average 19.9. 8.8 rebounds from a shooting guard position, 3.4 assists, shot 43.8% from three. So he came through town, and I start getting this feeling that like we are kind of hyper-focused on like one position when we still know that the Kings need a backup five um, and and maybe future backup five stuff. They, they need, you know, if, if they don't have Sasha, their draft looks different. If they're not going to retain... Harrison Barnes, their draft could look a different. Um, and then the other thing is, like, how much do you guys think that this will matter? The the G League is now, um, you now get three two-way contracts as opposed to two. And to me, that means that your second-round picks just took a big jump in value because now you could bring back a Keon Ellis on a two-way contract, but then you could look at pick number 38 and pick number 54 and or undrafted players that you might go after uh, as potential two-way players as well. So I think that that opens things up and it also, it maybe opens up a few more veteran spots, not only on your roster, but in the league overall, where maybe you don't need a third point guard. Maybe your third point guard is hiding on a two-way contract where you can move them back and forth. And if you need them. So like, I think that that in itself is, is an interesting conversation. Yeah. I think that, just the initial takeaway is exactly what you said that your second rounders become more valuable. Um, just having that additional roster spot. That's typically the type of guys that would fill into those two ways. Um, I think of a guy like potentially Chima Moneki last year. I don't know if he would have, would have done that, but um, say he's on a two way and then you can fill that roster spot with, with a different talent. So I, I think that, it does. It makes me more excited to go to more Stockton games. I will stay, and I like getting the opportunity to develop a couple more guys. Um, but initial takeaway is exactly what you said: that your seconds become a bit more valuable. That maybe you see less of the second rounders getting traded for cash straight up. Although I'm sure that'll happen to still still to to some extent. Yeah, Sean, same. Yeah, about the same. I mean, you saw look second rounders flying off the shelves <laughs> during the trade deadline. I think this was all, uh, you know, kind of foreseen. And uh, uh, I, I agree with the point that, yeah, second rounders become a little bit more valuable from that standpoint. But also I think um, the undrafted free agents, the, the, the people who, you know, once camp, once cut, cuts are made, um, you know, who's the camp meet that, that might be able to potentially fill that role on another team. So, uh, yeah, I mean, more roster spots, the better. Um, and it also kind of makes you, you know, kind of, at least for me anyway, maybe not most people, but thinking about expansion down the road, like how does this impact uh, adding two more teams potentially uh, in the not too distant future, possibly, you know, three years from now. Um, and just with the talent pool, of the league, like the league is in a really good spot from a talent standpoint. And um, I remember David Stern always being very, cautious of that like not wanting to dilute the talent pool of his players and uh i think the the talent is 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 certainly there to where two more teams can can fit and i and i i really feel adding roster spots like this adding more possibilities with the g league uh only only help that that idea that that you can strengthen uh you, that you will have that that strong talent pool going forward if you add more teams so uh, I think the league's in good hands, and uh, I'm glad that there's uh, more opportunities for for some of these guys to stay in the states. I will yeah. also say I think it makes your G League staff that much more important. And Paul mm -hmm. Johnson just wanting, just having one uh, G League Executive of the Year is just that much more important. Having an important staff in place there, I kind of feel like the Kings got like the uh, like the value pack, like like they just gave them all the awards. You get all the awards. Like you, you win the, uh, the medical staff of the year. You win the, um, uh, Miguel won the, uh, was it the equipment manager of the year? Like the Kings won them all. It's just like, uh, let's just give them all the Sacramento. It, it's kind of cool. Um, I didn't even know those trophy. existed. Domas got a trophy honest. for getting the most rebounds per game. I didn't know there was a physical trophy for that. 
Oh, is there really a trophy for that? He got awarded it the same day yeah. of the year and got his. Uh, I think there were three awards. Coach got all his three. coach of the year. Yeah, Domas got rebounding leader, and then De'Aaron got clutch player all on the same night. Okay, and what is it uh, with Domas? Who who is that award named after? Is it like the Moses Malone Award? I can look it up. I, I don't remember, but I, I I was down there on the on the floor um, for that moment for all three of them, and I was uh, I had forgotten that there was a trophy now for for the re- the top the league's top rebounder, and it was a uh, it's a it's a cool little trophy. Yeah, and and look, I, I wasn't meaning to be flippant about uh, Phil Johnson there. I, like I think he did a really good job of uh, Paul Johnson. Sorry of uh, of building out a team, and like that team was really good. Um, the the G League squad this year was really good, and they were the number one seed. And uh, they unfortunately lost in the playoffs. But uh, yeah, in the first I, I round of the impressed. playoffs. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I think they had a first round bye. I think they lost. They had a first, you're right. Sorry, their first game is what I meant to say. Yeah, their first yeah. game they played, they they lost, which was tough. But yeah, and, and you know the big piece to that that puzzle last year was Nimi. Um, do you guys think he's done enough? to earn the potential to be like the third center or backup center on this year's team. And we're talking about a guy who all G league, uh, first team defense, all G league, first team overall, uh, second in MVP balloting. Um, his stats are, are crazy. Um, uh, but there's still more that you kind of need to see from him in development, but can he do that? Can he do more at the G league level? Or is that just, you know, are we looking at him as the proverbial 4A player uh, from Major League Baseball that bounces back and forth between AAA and the big club? Or do you guys think he's got a shot to actually be the in, in the conversation for the backup center job next season? I, I personally feel from like an accolade standpoint, he's checked all the boxes. It doesn't mean he's ready for the NBA by any means, but, but him being around the team... Uh, like at this point last year, we were saying we want to see more of him in the G League. We want to see more <clears throat> reps for him, minutes for him, opportunity for him. Just really giving him playing time, which is something he didn't get a whole lot of in his in that rookie year. Um, and I think he benefited from being around the big team for his rookie season. I think he showed it in the second year. I like seeing two years of summer league with him. Uh, you don't need to have that this year. And uh, now that you have a restricted free agent in him, I, I don't see him as a two-way player anymore. I just don't know what more he can do from a G League standpoint. Certainly there's areas to develop and, and improve, but I just don't think at this point he can get that in the G League. I think he has to get that in the NBA. Um, and, but the flip side to that coin is I don't know that there's opportunity that exists from a rotational standpoint. So, um, they'll have a decision to make. I think. I think it's it's one that that they. I feel that they that he's checked all the boxes, and I and hopefully he's done them in a in a in a efficient and rapid manner to where it does fit something on the on the NBA roster. I just don't know from a rotational standpoint that he's ready yet. But certainly, when you look at just the way this this season will be with an in season tournament, there, there there should be plenty of opportunity for him. Uh, to be able to to get some moments, I just don't think it'll be something that you can fil- you can factor in from a rotational standpoint. Hmm. Yeah, I'd like to see him get some opportunities, um, but I certainly don't think you can rely on him to like be your backup big or anything like that. Third string, maybe. Um, I think it was inconsistency for me. I honestly was pretty surprised that he got runner up in G League MVP. I, I think that he had a good year, but you know, nine of his. 29 games played he scores over 20 but then there's six where he scores 10 or less like you you have some nights where he's just totally dominant a 31 and 12 game uh 28 10 and 4 game with two steals and two blocks and and then you have nights where it's 10 points four rebounds and an assist you know like I, i think it was just some inconsistencies for me and I don't love the rebounding number for a guy of his size. 8.8 a game certainly isn't bad, but I think you would hope it would be higher for a guy his size in the G League. So I still think there's questions. Um, not fouling would be a big one. Obviously, the sample of going up against Joel Embiid is as tough as it gets, but I'm sure remembering that game, he had two or three fouls instantly in that game. Um, I think back to this is rookie year, I guess, for him, but he went up against Jared Allen and had a really tough time. So I think there's certainly going to be an adjustment, but I think the only way you find out if he can keep up in the, in the, with the big club at this point is 
to give them some chances. But if they decided to go in a different direction, I don't feel like I, I wouldn't feel like they were just letting something go and they, it was totally the wrong decision. Hmm. Okay. No, I mean, you're right, Brendan. He's nowhere near being ready for guarding the likes of Giannis. We saw, you know, any of that. Yeah. There, there's a lot of stuff developmentally that he just either isn't there yet or potentially will never be there yet. But um, I just, I just don't know. Again, there's, there's so much you can take away from the G league. Uh, there's so much you can, you can have room to grow and develop, but there's a lot of haphazard basketball in there and a lot of people trying to get theirs. So uh, my point to that is I just don't think there's much more for him to do there to accomplish there that, you know, I think a lot of the stuff that they need him to get better at is ultimately things that you get better at from an NBA level, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it does make sense. Um, I, I think it brings us to like a, a different discussion too, because clearly the Kings have Sabonis, who's going to play, you know, 34 to 36 minutes a night. There is some, I mean, Monty McNair in his exit interview did bring up an interesting point that there's a possibility that the Kings could look for a, a true center and, and let Domas play some more power forward and play alongside a big center. Um, but like the way that we saw this last season and we've got a stack of, of guys that are, we're going into the off season that are, uh, that are free agents. And so uh, it, it brings us like to a larger discussion about like who will be back, who won't be back. And, um, you know, first of all, I think for some reason, well, there's not for some reason we understand, like, it looks like Mike Brown just is not going to give Rashawn Holmes an opportunity uh, to kind of earn his spot back, or it's possible that Rashawn Holmes just hasn't shown that he's he's ready to earn that uh, any minutes back with the team. Um, but he's under contract for two years. But a guy like Alex Lynn, like if you're looking at what Alex Lynn can bring versus what Nemeas Keda, clearly one guy has more experience, one guy, you know, he does certain things. But what do you guys think about Alex? Is he going to be back, or are we looking at? Have we already seen the last days of Alex Lynn in Sacramento? Uh, uh, it's a, it's a interesting, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I think there's, there's a, there's a possibility that he can be back. I wouldn't count on it though. Um, I think that they could and should do better, but, um, you know, I, I don't think, for example, you bring up what Monty McNair said about moving Domas to the four with the right center. Alex Len is not that center. No, I mean, he, that, that would be like a Brooke Lopez scenario. Um, if, if you had someone like Brooke Lopez who was there and, and at that point, sure. Then of course, Domas takes the, the power, maybe some power forward minutes there, but, um, you don't do that with Alex Len and, uh, Alex Len is a very tertiary, uh, piece on this team and doesn't really, you know, factor to be that all, all that much impactful. So you, when, when I think that they're talking about bringing in a different center or, or having a, a role played from with somebody else i don't think they're referring to alex len so i would uh i would if i if i had a you know had to pick a, a path i would say he's not on this team brennan yeah i think you can do better um you know i think guys that are probably out of the price you want to spend on bigs but intriguing like a mason plumley nasri dwight powell um, but you go a little lower like a drew eubanks uh, jock lawndale i i think are are somewhat intriguing so i think you would hope to do better there i'm I'm intrigued. People bring up Drew Eubanks all the time, and I watch Drew Eubanks play basketball, and I don't want to watch him play basketball anymore. I mean, not to to be rude, but like that's that's like a fifteenth man on a playoff team. Like, I, it, it actually, it's not. He's not on a playoff team. Like, <laughs> like, not. no. I mean, like Jock Landale, sure, and even uh, like Thomas Bryant, I think, is a unrestricted free agent. Like he would be intriguing and a guy that you could probably play alongside Domas with his ability to shoot. I think that that's something that I would, I would look at, but my guess is that Alex Lynn won't be back. Um, and it, it's not because Alex did anything wrong or anything else. It's just that, you know, the days of needing that type of center on your roster um, are, are kind of in the past. And if they were going to do something like you, you brought up Brooke Lopez, I'd even bring up, like if the Kings were going to do some something really strange and big this summer that just had you scratching your head, it would be like Nikola Vucevic, where 
I think he actually could for moments because of his ability to shoot the three play alongside Domas. And then you'd get, you know, uh, you'd have a true backup center that you could move in and out of the rotation in different ways. So uh, he's going to cost you more, but at 32 years old, how much more is he going to cost? And you'd have to make some sort of trade. But like, I, I think you guys are, are right. Like the, it's probably somebody better than Alex Lynn if you are going to choose that option, right? And it may not even be a guy like the other two guys that we have to discuss in this, in this who they're keeping and who they're not. Um, you got Trey Lyles and you've got Shemezi Metu, who both played center for the, the Kings last season. I think there's a better chance that Trey Lyles is back, but where are you guys at with, uh, with Metu and what you think, like, will he be back, will he not be? I uh, just think it's too early to tell. I mean, you know, you get <laughs> no one, none of us have a, a crystal ball in front of us. So these are, there, there are, there are scenarios in which these guys can be back for sure. But, um, you know, how's the, how's what, what happens after the draft? What happens um, with free agency those first few weeks? I don't think that um, somebody like Chemezi Metu is a 40, first 48 hour free agency uh, signing. No. So, um, Trey Lyles probably isn't either, although um, he certainly factors to to be a little sooner than somebody like Mezzi at the at this point. But um, no, you 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 keep the conversations open and alive because uh, you know the NBA can change quick. I think for Mezzi, um, I don't love his game on this roster. I feel like he kind of is between a four and a five. I, I think that. For him individually, the my two cents is that he'd benefit from going to a team that just gave him more room to make mistakes and and kind of learn through it. You know, I, I think a a Portland, a Houston, like a Charlotte could be could be good for Messi to just get a little bit more opportunity and figure out what his ideal NBA role is. Um, and, and then for Trey Lyles, to me, it is pretty dependent on Sasha. I think there's a lot of overlap there unless you're committing to Trey Lyles as your backup five, which I don't think is the way to go personally. So for me, Trey has a lot to do with Sasha, even though Trey did admittedly tug at my heartstrings in his exit interviews with just wanting to find a, a NBA home sort of talk, but can't consider that in this. Well, I think what you can consider though, is that he was a really good player for the Kings last year. Yeah. Um, where I would say that Metu was like almost like, forced into action quite a few times because you really didn't have another option or you weren't going to use Rashawn Holmes or for like 87 percent of the season, you weren't going to use Alex Lynn and then out of nowhere you decided to use Alex Lynn. So I thought that all of that was interesting, but like if I'm going to make a guess, I, I would say that there's a much better chance that Trey Lyles is back on the team. And I do think it is sort of dependent on the Sasha situation where it would make it very difficult to have both those guys on the, on the team at the same time, unless you are going to let Trey be your, your small ball five. Um, but he, he, you know, can he play next to Sabonis? Yeah, he can play next to Sabonis as like a, a four. So I don't know. I, I just think that like there were enough, like Metu is, is a player that, a lot, a lot of mistakes, and we're looking at the back end of what should be uh, a pretty solid roster next season, and I have a hard time believing that he'd be back. And I know, like, we're talking about, oh, it's, like, so far away, but it's really not. Like, free agency is in, is in three weeks. So, like, these things are well, going to be decided relatively quick. To give, just to give Mezzi just one little, you know, kind of uh, positive, though, in his, in his, uh, just in his favor there is that he really fits the way they play very, very well. Um, he's adaptable. He runs, um, he can Phenomenal get a athlete. I mean, right. I mean, yeah, I, I, I comes to mind too. just remember that first uh, game that Domas, uh, I know we're a long way from that, but the first game that Domas uh, stepped foot in a King's uniform, Mezzi was like the recipient of many, many a dunk <laughs> in that game. Um, so as a cutter, as a runner, as a, as a, somebody who can, you know, get above the rim, um, especially in a regular season. Um, I, I just, I think, I think what happened with Mike is the, Mike Brown noticed that obviously that, um, that Trey Lyles was obviously playing well, fitted, fit a different role, uh, a more, um, as you kind of tr 
you know, whittle down the, the rotation number minutes a little bit, um, become a little bit more finite. Uh, I, you're not as, you're not as, f- you know, free and loose and, and free flowing as, as you, maybe you probably should be, um, in to a larger extent, especially in the regular season where the regular season is one thing, obviously playoffs basketball becomes different, but, um, he also plays with physicality. So, um, I, I just because they didn't, get playing time or he wasn't factored into the playing time equation with the way the season wound down. And then certainly at the, um, with the series, with the, with the, with the Warriors, you know, there was some of us that were thinking, man, Mezzi could probably make an impact in this warrior series. So um, don't, don't look at the way they finish the season and then, and then eliminate him from having a role going forward because one, it really doesn't have much to do with the other. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I hate being this guy. I think Mezzi is a, pretty bad fit on this roster actually i definitely oh, disagree okay. with you sean I, I just like i don't think he i mean i just next to don't go from what mike brown was saying too i mean mike brown is is hyped him up that could be him just trying to give him some kudos and and and, and i don't necessarily agree disagree with you brendan i'm just again i i want to echo what mike brown says about uh chemezi met too right he, he definitely liked the switchability that he would talk about one to five um I didn't think Messi was great at that, but it's definitely the best way to go about having him out there defensively. Um, and I don't know, the shooting's not there. He does have great athleticism, obviously, and like this intriguing fluidity. Um, but I, I just think so much of him is still hypothetical to me. I I agree. And at 26, it shouldn't be hypothetical. So that's a problem. You know what I mean? Like he's he's still on a... Like the Kings have his rights. They actually have his Larry Bird rights because he's been with the franchise for over three years. Um, but like, I just don't know that there's enough where you have to have him back. I think that there will be younger, like better options. Like again, Brendan, you brought up Nas Reed. Like I clearly could see the Kings chasing Nas Reed. I think Nas Reed would make a lot of sense for the Sacramento Kings. And then that alleviates a lot of the questions like who comes back, who doesn't. Um, because Nas can play with Domas. He could also play with Sasha Vizenkov. He could also play with Trey Lyles and all kinds of different combinations. And so I think there are pieces that you instantly could see would fit in and sort of change the complexity of the players around them, which is something that I don't think you get from, from Chemezi. Like I thought Chemezi did a really good job early in the season against the Warriors, um, and he helped turn around a couple of games. I think he had moments where he was really good, especially in the pick and roll with Malik Monk. And then there are moments where you're like, okay, he, we all know that he's out of the rotation for the next three games because you saw it happen. You're like, Oh man, he's lost his way. So yeah, I think that the Kings are going to, they're going to be a pretty aggressive at that position and, and try to come up with something, some other ideas at the four or five than what they currently have. Uh, but that's just my own personal. Um, we have two more players. Well, I mean, I'm not going to really throw PJ Dozier in there. Um, PJ Dozier is what he is, whether he, you know, the Kings need a, a reserve that can do some things. Maybe, maybe they will bring him back as like the 15th man on the roster. Um, but Terrence Davis and Harrison Barnes, uh, both players who have been with the Kings for, you know, three plus years. Well, I think two and a half and then three, I mean, four and a half for, for Barnes. Um, what do you guys think about Terrence? Because for me, I'm looking at Terrence as he's still young enough, but um, you know, that's when we start getting into some of these players in the draft or you start getting into what do the team, what does the team really need? If you're going to have a fifth or a sixth guard, um, does he fit that bill? And I'm not sure that he does. And I, I'm just like, my first instinct is that Terrence Davis probably won't be back, but where are you guys at? I, I'd lean toward that myself, um, but certainly could see something that that manifests to where he is. Yeah, um, you know, it, it, he he's a guy who's made a lot of playing, made a lot of his playing time at at moments. But um, you know, there's some much like with Mezzi, there's some frustrations that come with that as well. So um, I, I like the fact that year he got here, it was um, wasn't shy about shooting the basketball. Um, yeah, and. and Never really is, uh, and obviously he had some pretty big moments in the regular season. But uh, no, I, I I think much like Mezzi, this is a you know you can probably do better, but uh, this is a player who I don't think that is going to command much more in the dollar figure 
than he already makes. So, um, you know, you could do worse than Terrence Davis, but I think that, uh, I, I think his, uh, ultimately that the Kings will probably be with somebody else. Yeah, he's a guy that was playing in game six and seven in that postseason series. So I, I think there's definitely things that, that TD brings. He had that obviously 31 ball TNT TD against Brooklyn. He had four games of 20 plus four others from 15 to 20 in there as well. And, and that's what he is. He's going to have 10 games a year where he gives you some really good offensive production um, and you, you keep him out there, but I lean with Sean of like, I think you can do better. And I don't know if I'm greedy because that's going to be my answer for a lot of these. But I think that after you get an idea of what this core looks like, that better doesn't necessarily mean just a better overall player, but a better fit to complement what these guys are. Um, I I think of a guy like, like Tory Craig could give you a little bit more defense, you know, is, is Mm -hmm. Georges Niang somewhat interesting there. So I, I think that there's potentially better fits than TD, um, and him playing game six and seven does say a lot, but I think ideally you'd have a different guy that you're throwing out there to fill that spot. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like, I, I think that like, again, we're, but what we're getting to here is we bring up Delhi's gone Dozier, uh, Metu. Like if we're, if a gun to our head, we're probably saying is gone. Uh, Terrence Davis, same thing. Alex Len, same thing. We have Trey Lyles and Harrison Barnes who are on the bubble. Um, but we're looking at five five players at a minimum, and that's a lot of turnover. That's a and probably six and possibly seven, and that's without the Rashawn Holmes question. Do they find a home for Holmes? We're we're looking at like between seven and eight players on a team that won forty eight games last year, and that's a substantial like flop. And is that too much? No, you- because they're all they're all such back end players that most of them don't factor into the equation much at all. I mean, you literally just said Matthew Delavadova. How okay. how many minutes did he log? But you know my I mean? response like, would is- be to that, Sean, is that they they weren't players on this last year's team because the Kings didn't get hurt. Like this is the healthiest team in the NBA, so their depth. I don't. I look at this and I don't like this depth. And, and the reason why we didn't really have to worry so much about that depth is because they didn't get injured, which is, right. you know, kudos to them for yeah. not getting hurt. Uh, but and, and, and even if they had, some of those players still wouldn't have played. You know what I mean? Like, that's not, I don't really factor some of those players into depth per se. Um, but I'm you're with right. you, like I, with Della Vidova and Dozier right. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, these are these are guys that you're just literally have as practice players, role players, people who, who, you know, you, you got to pay someone. You need to, you know, especially a guy like Della Vadova who has a voice within the locker room. Uh, yeah. Total glue guy, total chemistry, um, extension of the head coach. You know, there's a value there for sure. I'm not trying to take away from him, but, uh, but, but when you get that deep, it's like I, I don't feel that. Make no mistake, if you're, you're if you're talking about the back seven, the back six, whatever it looks like, and you're 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 turning some of those people over, no one's going to say that no one's going to look at what you turn around and let's say everything else remains the same. People are going to still look at that and say, well, it's a run it back here because it is like your, yeah. your, your main, your main cast of characters has not changed. And you could argue that it shouldn't change because you did get third in the West and, you know, won 48, 49 games. So um, I, I can understand that for sure. But yeah, yeah. I mean, that's changing that much personnel won't really factor much unless one of those players that you're substituting ends up being a major cog in the rotation uh or playing a bigger a bigger piece than just being a back six player Hmm. okay um okay let's get to this question then uh if if we we have no idea who's going to be back and who's not and we can we can prognosticate but at the end of the day we have you know um and and I want to lump Harrison Barnes into this discussion. So uh, Harrison Barnes is, of course, the the King's biggest free agent that they have. Um, we have no idea what he's going to make on the open market, um, or if you know he might consider a sign and trade, or if he wants to be back. Um, but if not, the Kings are going to look at you know. There's a couple of options they can trade for guys like OG and Anobi, which may not come up for trade and may be like way too expensive for their blood. Uh, but the sort of the free agent class 
some of the names that kind of stand out that would make sense uh, are Cam Johnson. Um, why am I PJ uh, Washington, Washington? Jeremy Grant. Yeah, Jeremy Grant, Kelly Oubre. Um, like, where are you guys at with this group? Uh, of course, Cam and and PJ Washington are restricted, so you're going to have to pay extra for that or you might have to give up something in, in addition to that. But if you're looking at Harrison Barnes at 31 years old and you're trying to get younger at the position and trying to strengthen that position, and this really might be the one position on the floor where you can upgrade as of right now, um, is there a player that you guys like out of that group? And, and how would you attack the uh, sort of the free agent window, the trade season that's coming up uh, starting June 30th? I love Cam, I love Cam Johnson, but I think so does Phoenix. You know, I, I don't think. Uh, oh, Brooklyn now, or excuse me, Brooklyn. Yes, excuse yeah. me, Brooklyn. I, I think they love him as well. Um, I don't think that's going to be something that's uh that's going to change there. Um, I can't imagine them letting him get away. But he's made it Kings, clear he doesn't want go, to play. Uh, there. He's made it clear the, he doesn't want to be back. But yeah, if okay. you're the Kings, go get him. Go get it. Go sign him to an offer sheet. You know and see if, if anybody matches or you can orchestrate a sign and trade. I think that would be an upgrade. Hmm. Uh, Brendan, who's your guy? I do kind of like Jeremy Grant. Um, 29. Oof. I mean, it's only two years younger than HB. It depends what sort <laughs> of salary we're talking about. Um, because again, ideally this is an upgrade and there's potential of that just being a, a lateral move. Um, but I think that when Jeremy Grant is, locked in on the defensive end that he has shown some uh, weak side rim protection, that there is a sample of him playing in Denver off of a passing big. And you can see the, the cutting and athleticism coming into play there. Some three point shooting um, switchability when it comes to guarding threes or fours. So Jeremy Grant's intriguing to me. There's just a lot of dependence on like what number we're really talking about there. Um, same as there was when Portland traded for him last deadline. And obviously there's been no, extension agreed upon it because that was a hot topic then that it was some ridiculous number for Jeremy Grant. Um, and, and I do kind of like PJ Washington. You know, I think that there is interesting upside there. I think he's a play finisher and I don't think there's that much creating for others there, but I think a play finisher is, is kind of what you need offensively in that role. And, and there's intriguing aspects defensively, but if you're going PJ Washington, I think he's a tier lower than a lot of these guys and you're kind of betting on him being able to take a jump in a good system um, where he has a clearly defined role compared to what he's been going through first couple of years in Charlotte. Also, James, you didn't mention the guy that I would like, which would be Josh Hart. Yeah. Okay. So Josh Hart, the reason, well, I mean, <laughs> again, I think he will, the Knicks love him For and, sure. he, lo and For he loves sure. the Knicks. And so, yeah, I, I like, I like Josh Hart too. And I think he checks a ton of boxes, great rebounder, very, very good defensive player, three and D guy. A uh, good teammate, good role, you know, role player who fits in and knows his job. Um, and and actually, I I would say, like, he's kind of the opposite of Kelly Oubre. Like, they might be like in, <laughs> inverted players, <laughs> where Kelly Oubre would be my choice out of a lot of these guys. Because I, I mean, if you can get Cam Johnson, that's pretty impressive. I mean, there's some way you can trade for OG Ananobi. That's my like ultimate goal here. Sure if I'm uh, if I'm the Sacramento Kings and uh, but when it comes to Kelly Oubre I think he's got that little bit of crazy in him that the Kings need and the erratic the crazy that like makes him sort of in the same realm of on court as uh, as Malik Monk um, you know sort of a wild card and what he's going to do where I think the Kings in a lot of, at, at a lot of moments get a little stagnant in who they are and what they do. And he had a really good season. I mean, he had some injury issues, but he averaged like what he was he 20, uh, 20.3 points, 5.2 rebounds, 1.4 steals. He's a super athlete. And I think the Kings need athleticism. They need length. They need, um, they need someone who, who can kind of break from the cycle of what it is that they're doing on a, like, every every play basis uh but i i don't know and, and i also like that De'Aaron fox and him are close and that they played a u ball together and that De'Aaron fox likes him 
and, and those things do matter a little bit. Uh, they're not yeah. the end all be all, but I still think, you know, we're talking about a guy who's 27 and he kind of fits in the same mold as, you know, the other guys that are around 26, 27. Although PJ Washington's younger. Um, I just don't, the, I guess the one fear I have with PJ is kind of the same fear I have with, uh, with Jeremy Grant. Jeremy Grant to me is put up numbers only on bad teams. Like there's, he doesn't rebound either. No, at all. Jeremy Grant is like, he went to Portland and they got worse and everyone thought that was going to be a, a great, Oh, this is great signing for them. And it, it was terrible. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I also think, you know, that's my one concern with Cameron Johnson is also rebounding. Like, um, I mean, obviously they play slightly different roles, um, but I think that Cameron Johnson gives you more overall than what Jeremy Grant does. Jeremy Grant just for the most part, just brings scoring. Um, you know, I know there's some, I guess, a little bit of defense there, but um, neither one rebound to my liking. They're they're probably um, Jeremy Grant of all those players you mentioned. I think it's Kelly Oubre and and Jeremy Grant towards the bottom, and I don't know which one I like more than the other. To be honest, between the two, <laughs> I think well, another I- guy that should be part of the conversation, I'm sure, is everybody's going to love is uh, six seven all defensive second team Dylan Brooks. I do think he belongs in the conversation. He's a damn good defender. Yep. And yep. was just starting on one of the better teams in the West. Like, and, and you I don't need him to got score. scapegoated with that whole yes, he did. of uh, under no circumstances. I understand not wanting him back, but don't blame your first round exit on Dylan Brooks. I, I said as much. I said you had a scapegoat. You used it. Um, you weren't going to have him back anyway. And everyone knew that it was going to be a numbers game. Um, and when you, you know, he's a guy that, you don't need to dis- you know, you don't need him to go out there and score a ton. He's capable of putting up some figures. He's just not a great shooter, but does everything else really, really, really well. Um, and this team could handle a little bit of crazy. And I think he would help bring them an identity. And I think this coaching staff and this roster is strong enough to uh, to keep someone like that in check and in line a little bit and hold someone accountable. And I think the role he could play um, is one he could thrive in. I think he could honestly be like a um, um, that I, I feel he that type of role on this team, especially when you know look at just look at when Memphis went back when Memphis didn't have a John Mar- didn't have John Morant playing or didn't have Stephen Adams playing, and look at the way those role players stepped in and and really kind of held the rope as as Dave Yeager likes to say and James has echoed a lot. Uh, that, that that's that's what you can um, you can count on someone like that, and they, you can obviously see him fulfilling a need for sure. And and if if in the event Davion Mitchell is still on this on this team, Mitchell and 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 Brooks together would be really fun. I'm intrigued by him. I, like I don't like the antics, and you know, yeah, like I, and I and I also don't. This like is entertainment. That he shot less than forty percent from the field, and he's not a good three point shooter at all. And James, so, James, he could be he could be like a Tony Allen type with with Sacramento, you know. You maybe, know how I feel but, about Tony Allen. But Tony <laughs> Allen actually hit his threes uh, right. for the most part, and he was aggressive going to the basket. Dylan Brooks takes a lot of really poor shots, really poor That's shots. Right. Don't don't shoot the ball, Dylan. <laughs> but is that going to happen? Is that something that's going to happen? Can you get him to not shoot the ball? Can you get him to give the ball up in in crucial moments and not make bad decisions? Like the basketball IQ in Sacramento went up so high last year that I'm worried that like, I I don't know if like one guy can take it down a notch, but you certainly, if you put a bunch of money into him, you could end up with, with like diminishing roles at some point if he won't buy in and he won't do the things that you're asking him to do. If not at 27, good defender, like they're in the past. I, I certainly would have, gone you know that direction i i would have given I mean, up something for him last year when he was available the other thing too is like i think people need to realize like we make it sound like this kid can't hit water falling out of a boat like he's a decent he's he, like he hasn't shown the ability he's, it's been a lower th- 30 but he he came into the league 35 37 35 percent first three seasons like he, he hovers averaged around 35 18.4 for- points per game not last season but the season before Right, like, right. like he, he like, was a bona fide scorer for them. Yeah, my point is that you can have that. You just have to put him in better positions to succeed. And 
not being a chucker. And I think, look, this is a this is a perfect situation for him because it's equal opportunity offense. I mean, this everyone can get buckets. Like, who wants a bucket? Go get it. It's very true. All right, so I'm going to throw the last one out at you guys, uh, just to like stir the pot, like always. But um, would you revisit the John Collins situation, or would you be like, no way in hell am I going John Collins? Because for me, I'm looking at John Collins at 25 potential to get back to who he was before. Who was uh, he before? Well, he averaged 20 and 10 like three years ago. Uh, so with 1.8 blocks per game and he shot 39% from three. Yeah, but do you think that's what he is? Do you think that's what he is as a player? I think he's he can be 17 and eight without trying. Like, I, I don't know. And, and I also think, you know, he kind of, I, I think I've said this before, but he kind of is what you hoped that Marvin Bagley would be. Right. Like, he needs he needs a change of scenery for sure. Yeah. And I think it I think ultimately kind of depends on what you do with Harrison Barnes if you're uh you know I, I can't see both of them being on the on the team together. Okay, so but what if you made a move where let's say like the only way I'm taking John Collins. I'll, I'll just like say this. I don't know what the the pick situation would be. Clearly I you take your top 14 protection off of the 2024 pick and give it to him. Maybe you throw in a couple of second round picks down the road. Um, but for me, the biggest thing would be um, like I, I look at John Collins and I'm like, if you gave up Rashawn Holmes and they would have to take Rashawn Holmes for the next two years, you basically get John Collins for half price, right? He makes 25 million, Holmes makes 12. And for the next two years, it would be half price. And then the third year, you'd have a you know, $26.5 million. Uh, payday that you'd have to pay him but uh, i still think it would be it's it's worth the gamble at that and if let's say you give you give up davion or you give up something else in that package i i still think that it might be worth it because there's potential for all-star level player there and and i trust him a little bit more i think he's more of a of a real impactful player than a guy like uh, like kyle kuzma who we didn't discuss, who could be part of this discussion as well. I think Kuzma is better for what it's worth, but I, I'm with you on a lot of what you're saying on Collins. I think it's intriguing. Last year was just a mess. James, I remember there's a game last year you were looking at your prize picks and the over-under on John Collins was crazy low. It was low. And, <laughs> and we were like, close. it has to be over. And he finished the game with single-digit points. He has 22 games this year with nine, or um, 22 games this year with single-digit points. Um, he does also have, you know, 10 games with 20 plus, And a lot of that has to do with the big variance in shot attempts. I think that we've seen him be an okay rim protector at times in the past. So I think it's intriguing. I mean, where you, where you, my ears really perk up is the idea of like Rashawn Holmes being included in that. If that's a deal that could well, potentially yeah. happen. Yeah. Um, and then obviously draft assets would have to be included as well. And maybe it's an easier conversation because Atlanta is the one that already has all the current protections and you can have that conversation with them. Uh, but John Collins has three years, 78.5 million remaining about 25 to 26 a year. Rashawn Holmes has two years remaining both with player options on their final years. So they'd be getting out of one year worth of that salary. Um, so I, I do think there's, there's something there. I'd certainly talk myself into Collins. Hmm. Okay. But I mean, to me, it, it's, it's intriguing. Like I, I would have to, I would have to really, really think hard and I'd also need to see x-rays and stuff. Cause he's had some weird injury issues and in, including the finger and, and stuff. So, uh, like he's intriguing to me. And, and if I go back to like 23 year old John Collins, he was so good. I mean, 20 and 10 shot 40% from three average 1.6 blocks per game. Like if you were going to drop a really, really strong, like potential player to put alongside uh Demonis Sabonis, it's probably him. Like just like the skill set wise. And so I I don't know. I'm intrigued. I, I guess the, the other we didn't uh we didn't discuss uh Wood. Um no Christian Wood? Christian Wood. No. Yeah I, it's a no too because like I think we've all had some conversations around but Christian Wood like if on paper is is so good man like a lot of players on paper also yeah. like 
we can't evaluate players based off price picks. Oh no, 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 <laughs> no, no! But you know how no. bad Dallas I have the needed worst a guy. guy. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Dallas needed a guy so bad. They needed Christian Wood to be good. Like he really, really would have benefited their team. And the fact that um, his minutes diminished the way they did, I, I just think speaks a lot. Well, I mean, look at his season. He averaged 16.6 points, 7.3 rebounds, 1.1 blocks. He shot 37.6% from three. He did all of that in 25.6 minutes. And I, I believe that they were horrible when he was on the floor. His per 36 is 23 and 10 with a block and a half per game. Like the paper version of him looks phenomenal. And I don't like, but there's something about like not being a, a winning basketball player. And there's something about just being able to put up stats. And that's kind of what it felt like with him. He just puts up stats where he goes, but it has no bearing on whether you win or lose a game ever. And that's a problem. So, but again, like you look at the, the Kings are looking for a long athletic three point shooting, shot blocking, rebounding, scoring, power forward he checks every single box but the answer is no right oh not for me no not for me if i mean if it would be honestly if they went out and signed christian wood or went after christian wood i would uh i i that would that would be a move that that, that would surprise me because i just don't think that uh i don't know i'm with you I don't think that that would fit all right if, if the idea is back up five of minutes here and there on domas i don't hate it but I'm not. But you don't go sign it. You don't go get him for that. No, you know, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Let's finish up with the business of basketball. Um, we're like three weeks away from fireworks. Uh, maybe two weeks away fireworks. from the draft. And I don't know. Uh, like, did you literally mean Fourth of July, or did you mean like? No. No, oh, I meant didn't. like okay. fireworks. I mean like like everything happens. Like it's like it's no like the California sparklers. classic. Yeah, yeah. Snakes and sparklers. Exactly. But if we're looking, it may not at, be a firework, but you're looking at possibly something yeah. that fizzles. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Something that we light on fire in some way or another. It um, may explode. It may just be a dud. It may just be a dud. Exactly. Um, but if you guys are, are looking at, uh, well, let's say we, we know the starters as of right now. Um, do you think they have a different starting lineup after like maybe the 6th of July? Why do you do this? I, just because I've got to. <laughs> do you think they have? I, because that means that either Harrison Barnes you isn't think... back or. I don't know. Oh. I just like to mess with you. I don't know. I have no idea. I think there's a, that's the biggest question is what to do with Harrison Barnes. And yep. um, that's the one that's going to impact your off season the most uh, in my opinion. So um, I, I honestly can't forecast it very well because it, going back to what I've said in previous podcasts, I think there's a number you have in mind that you're comfortable with the idea of Harrison Barnes being back on your team. And then there's, there's a, possibly a different reality. So I think you have that line drawn in the sand and does it move at all? Um, you know, do, how much money is Sasha taking uh, in, in coming over to the Kings? And you may have, I mean, this this front office may already have the uh, the X, Y, and Z package already in, in it kind of wheels in motion to move on from Harrison Barnes. Um I don't know that it's, I just don't know where it's at. And and that's the kind of the wait and see mode where maybe closer you get to the off season, maybe you have to get through the draft first. Uh, some of that will become a little bit more clear, but as of June 9th, 2023 with the NBA finals, a two, one series lead for, <laughs> for Denver, I have no clue guys. I really, I can't, I mean, I know what my gut maybe tells me and my gut tells me that it, it, it's it, that he's, probably back um although i don't know that it's one that i would do uh i think if it were me i would probably go look to upgrade the position myself but um yeah i, I just i really have no idea do you do you have any uh brendan any... i have no idea but i'll play along okay. um I, I think that they'll go in a different direction i think that they'll try and find somebody to upgrade hb and be pretty aggressive in doing so using the 
resources you have, whether that means j- dumping Rashawn with the pick to open up more cap space. And then maybe you can work your way into like Kyle Kuzma conversations or some of the restricted guys we talked about, um, or just straight up going in and trading for somebody else that's still currently under contract. So I will guess that it is a different person as that starter. Okay. I'm going to say, I believe there will be a, a different starting five, but I'm not sure how I, I'm pretty sure that it won't, that, that they'll do something that doesn't mean that Harrison Barnes won't be back. Cause I think you can have a different starting five and have Harrison Barnes back. I also think that you could have Harrison Barnes back and swap out one of the other four starters and still have him as a starter. Uh, like I think that there are options here. So um, I think I, I'm going to be open for whatever, but I, my guess would be probably 60, 40 that we have a different starting five after, you know, like by the 10th of July, the 8th of July, whatever, you know, when we're deep enough into free agency, then we actually see stuff that that's happening. All right. Well, let's wrap this thing well, up. Sean's got to go yeah. to work I, and, and stuff. I do. You got to go to work and stuff. I actually <laughs> have to get on the radio in just a few uh let's uh let's do final thoughts brendan do you have any final thoughts uh i'm begging people to stop mocking chris murray to the kings <laughs> just be more Please. creative Is that it what makes you're sense it makes sense yes if chris murray's there it should be strongly considered but please just i want to open a mock and read people's opinions on who could fit going to sacramento and 70 to 80 percent of times it is chris murray and it feels lazy to me. I'm I'm tired of it. I like Chris Murray. It's nothing against Chris Murray, but please, I just want to hear other opinions on who people like to Sacramento. And the comp where you're like, who who does he compare to? A left-handed Keegan Murray. Yeah, I mean, like, come I, mean, on, I, come on. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, <laughs> like, huh? yeah, but Sean, one of them is <laughs> a fourth pick. One of them in this scenario <laughs> is the twenty fourth pick. There's a substantial difference in the player and like, I, I, yeah, I I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I said that at least a month ago where I was like, you know, stop, stop. It was like, if you're putting Keegan Murray, you're just not, you're just not putting, or Keegan, if you're putting Chris Murray, you're just not putting, it is, but it's also an early process thing. Yeah. It is weird to see this far along that it's still there, but I will say like, um, you know, maybe at this point there end, ends up being more intel involved than than just blind hope. I don't believe that. I think it's just a still kind of a ah, just put them there. Just um, put them there. I, I I I just expect it at this point. Plus, like people need to step away from mock drafts. Like step there's mock drafts. Do you know? Do they just don't help you? They don't. They, you're you're not gleaming anything from the NBA draft or your or your preparation by looking at a mock draft and pining over it for hours upon hours or spending checking day by day to see like, Oh, what is, what is NBA draft.net have us this year? Like, are you out of your mind? Just who cares? It's 24th pick. Maybe just look at some players that you feel like can help your team. And if you fall in love with someone, you fall in love with someone. That's great. Put your own draft board together. You probably know more than most people putting these mock drafts together. Like, good Lord. A lot of these people who do, with respect to James, who used to do them, do them himself, a lot of people will do, they have metrics, right? So they have fans that will continuously hit Chris Murray, right? Click Chris, Chris Murray because they have Keegan Murray. And if Kings fans keep clicking in this region, guess what? They're going to put him in your mock draft. There's analytics for all kinds of web traffic. So just I've keep that in mind. I've never done that, Sean. That would be wild. But yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll delete the mock draft I was working on. There you go. Oh, you got one. You got yeah. one. Well, I'd be interested to see your mock draft. Yeah. I, I wouldn't call I you some after that. He would nerd Nick living draft. in a basement. <laughs> I would mock it. Yeah. Well, we <laughs> mock drafts are 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 they're supposed to be mocked. You know. Yeah, I, I think that's why they're called mock drafts. Right. No, that's not why they're Just called mock drafts. Uh, Sean, do you have any final thoughts? No, I think that was my final thought. My final. Uh, mm, no, not really. Uh, we got a lot of sports coming up, man. For it's like for a dead period, uh, it like you're we're finally in the summer, and uh, there's things that are sometimes that you know that gets a little wonky. Not a there's actually a lot going on still. Like we just did a 
interview with Kyle Harrison, uh, Kirsten Keller, who, uh, who works over at Fox 40 and I, we just did a interview with, nine, with the Giants top prospect, uh, uh, Kyle Harrison, who's lighting the, you know, triple A on fire and PCL. with the river cats, go check him out while you can. Cause he ain't going to be there long. Um, so I'd say that if you're into baseball and getting out and ch- enjoying some weather that hasn't gotten very hot yet, um, we're so lucky that it's June 9th and no triple digits yet. And although I'd welcome it. I love the heat. 76 degrees right now. I mean, that, I want to be out on the water, but it's, it's a little chilly to be out there. I mean, it's fine to be out on the boat, but once you jump in the water and get out, it's, it's cold. That's not warm enough yet. Uh, okay, final thoughts. Uh, I'm going to restate it uh, every single time, I think, at, on every podcast. Please don't swim in the rivers. Uh, another kid came up here to Bridgeport in Nevada City, Grass Valley, and drowned this last week. Um, so stop getting in the river. The river's horribly dangerous this year. Go to the lake. Although there was fights at Folsom Lake, too, so I don't know if you go to the lake. Uh, try to find somewhere to go swimming that's not the river. Um, outside of that... Um, Big thank you to Gary St. Jean for coming in for the happy hour. That was fun. Uh, if you haven't listened to last week's episode with Jerry Reynolds, that too was a lot of fun. Talked a lot about like uh, the difference between drafting in the lottery and drafting at number 24. And I thought Jerry's insight on that was really cool. Um, outside of that, uh, we're going to keep charging along and uh, keep writing and keep podcasting and, Keep hitting radio spots. You'll see all three of us on radio spots nonstop as we get up to the draft and uh, head into free agency, which is all like this thing's about to become a sprint. So um, be safe out there. And uh, I think that's going to do it. If you're no still NBA watching, final picks. Oh, sh- sh- yeah. What do you got? Um, we all, well, on we, all, we all said Denver, Denver in six. six. I'm sticking with we it. Did. We all said Denver in six. I, I'm actually feeling Denver in five, but like we all said, Denver in six. So the Miami game two win did nothing to kind of offset you or anything like that. Absolutely nothing. The best team (laughs) will win. The best player will win the MVP. That, that game the other night, Jesus, man, 30, 20 and 10 video game. What in just incredible people say he's padding stats. It looks casual. (laughs) He's yeah. going to pad his stats all the way to a NBA's final MVP. That's what he's about to do. So absolutely incredible what we're watching. Um, Sean, okay. you look like you're picking Miami the way you're acting. No, I, 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 I'm I, just hoping for a – I'm hoping I'm wrong. I hope it goes seven just because I want to prolong this. I am enjoying the series, albeit you know this last game <clears throat> didn't really have the, the desired effect I wanted it to. Game three was a little bit of a – a little bit of a dud. I thought it started out pretty well. I wanted to see a little bit more fight down the stretch, but it's a five point game at half. Um, you know, Gabe Vincent's playing well. Yeah. Michael Malone has something against the Miami Heat media room, which was <laughs> kind of a funny. I still don't know what point he was making. He just said, What a terrible media room. I don't know it what was, he was. It was because you could hear fans chanting, Let's go Heat while he was oh, in yeah. the media room. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's great. All right. I, hey, I'm pulling for Michael to get us uh, to get get the chip. That'd and cool. cool to see uh, uh, Rick Adelman uh, collect his lifetime achievement award. That was great. That was great. That was great. Yeah. So especially yeah, with David looks- right there, like David yeah. coaching in the in the in the finals on Denver and uh, very kind of welling up. You could see him. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. No, good stuff. Good stuff all around. Um, okay. Well, if uh, you're not a subscriber to the Kings Beat, make sure you do so. If you're still watching here on YouTube, don't mind, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, also, wherever you listen to your podcasts, whether it's Apple, Spotify, whatever, uh, give us a rating and review. That helps with the algorithm. Uh, become a subscriber to the Kings Beat. Go to thekingsbeat.com. Become a premium subscriber to get access to everything that we do. Uh, we'll be back next week with another pair of podcasts as we build towards the NBA draft. Be safe, have fun, enjoy the sunshine. Uh, so for Fox 40, Sean Cunningham and Brendan Nunes from the Kings Pulse podcast. I am James Hamby, Kings Insider for ESPN 1320 and the Kings Beat. See you next week. <laughs>